So welcome everyone. We are so glad you are able to join us this evening for this wonderful special webinar we have on spirituality. And um, we're glad you're here. My name is Naomi Hoffer. I'm the program manager for the Sherry Sobrato Brisson Brain Cancer Survivorship Program. And with me also here in the background is Alexa Greenstein, who is our survivorship nurse practitioner, and Mary Destree, who is our Marin um, Supportive Care Liaison Officer. You might see posts from both Alexa and Mary in the chat box. And this is part of our ongoing series, our Living Well After Brain Cancer Treatment webinar series, where we offer information on a variety of topics that is really designed to support you in living well. And in addition to this monthly webinar series, we also have a cognitive consultation clinic, we have exercise counseling, we have peer support, support groups, and many other services designed for your wellness. We invite you to check us out on our website. So we're gonna be covering the concept today of spirituality and what we mean by it. And maybe talking a little bit about how the word spirituality differs and the concept might differ a little bit from the word religion. We'll be discussing the concept of guilt and, and grief and the ways thinking about both of these aspects of survivorship um, might touch upon spirituality. And we'll be learning about the three spiritual paths to wellness. And then we're very fortunate to have Tolu Ladiande with us here today to share how her spirituality has changed and remained through the many highs and lows in her life. If time permits, both she and Rabbi Cher will be available to answer your questions. Please submit them using the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. And finally, we invite those of you who wish to continue the discussion and be led through an interactive activity to stay afterwards and turn on your cameras and are unrecorded after the show segment. We will give you instructions on how to do that at the end of the presentation. So now it's my absolute honor to introduce our featured speaker here with us today. Rabbi Jeremy Schur is a staff chaplain serving UCSF's Mount Zion campus. He has been a rabbi in the Jewish renewal movement since 2016. He has his master's in divinity from Harvard Divinity School, where he was the first rabbi to be ordained on the Harvard campus and is a graduate of the Clinical Pastoral Education Program at UCSF. He earned his bachelor's degree from MIT in mathematics. And prior to joining the career staff at UCSF, Jeremy ran a street ministry in Oakland and San Francisco in collaboration with the Gubbio Project and with First Presbyterian Church of Oakland. He then served as staff chaplain at the California Pacific Medical Center and as temporary chaplain and then on-call chaplain at UCSF. Rabbi Shur, thank you so much for being with us here today and helping with us, us to understand this topic. And I'm now going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be with you here um, and just to discuss spirituality a little bit. Um, everyone can please call me Jeremy. I usually use my first name in clinical contexts. Um, and uh, I just want to echo Naomi's welcome um, to everyone and uh, just thanks for being uh, on this journey uh, with us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quick. Oh, I see a question. What does MDiv mean? Master of Divinity. It's a master's degree that is uh, preparatory for the type of work I do uh, as a hospital chaplain. Um, okay, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Just trying to, okay. Am I uh, live with my screen sharing? Yeah, that looks great. Thank you, Jeremy. Great, okay, wonderful. Well, let's talk a bit, um, you know, as Naomi mentioned, about spirituality and religion. Um, two words that sometimes people see as interchangeable. I would say, you know, especially here in San Francisco, in my clinical experience, uh, maybe not so interchangeable. So religion is usually used to refer to um, something, some system of beliefs and practices that addresses those big questions of life. Uh, how do I make meaning? Um, how do I uh, be a good person? Um, those 
uh, types of big questions. What is morality? Um, what are my responsibilities as a person? Um, questions about um, death and dying as well. Um, the trouble with defining religion is that religions and religious cultures uh, differ a lot um, so that not every religion really, uh, not every uh, culture that we might use the word religion for um, really fits the type of, um, the type of um, box that we, might, uh, that we might be inclined to put it in um, modeled after a religion like Christianity. Um, some religions look more like philosophies. Um, some religions um, blur that line. Um, some religions look more like peoplehood. So um, what they have in common is some way of addressing the big questions, um, some system of beliefs and practices, but we have to be aware that cultures can be very different from one another. One question for you to think about is, do you have a religious tradition or a faith tradition? And if so, what role does it play in your spirituality? So spirituality is, I think, a set of universal questions in the human experience. We all ask these questions. We all go through spiritual uh, growth, spiritual wellness, spiritual resilience, as well as spiritual distress. Um, what does it mean? Why me? Who do I want to be? How can I make meaning out of where I am? All of us ask these questions. Grief is another big one. All of us go through grief at times, and we'll talk a lot more about grief uh, later on in the seminar. Um, so your spirituality may or may not involve religious beliefs. If you're a person with religious beliefs, that may be central to your spirituality. Um, for some people, it's, uh, it's, it's not. Um, and uh, the thing to recognize is that um, spirituality is universal. Um, religion is uh, more particular to a particular culture. Okay? Um, some of you may have done the uh, values clarification exercise that we uh, sent you home with a couple of days ago. Um, it's not required, um, but if anybody uh, did take a moment to uh, sit with your values and identify some values that are important to you, I wonder if you'd be uh, inclined to share them in the Q&A and we can uh, read some of those out. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, connection. Okay, thank you. Yeah, connection. Great. Anybody else? Okay, autonomy, attainment. So you can see how for different people, different uh, values might come to the fore. And some of us uh, you know, share values as well. Uh, courage, yeah. Our, uh, our cultures, our religions, if we have them, our personalities, our families of origin, all affect our values. Faith, family love, spirituality, hope. This is great, thank you for these. Awe, gratitude, this is just wonderful. What I hope the values clarification exercise was helpful with um, was getting in touch with, you know, your own sense of spiritual direction. Um, what, uh, in what ways do you make meaning? In what ways uh, do you live in concert with your deeply held beliefs? Respect, perseverance, yeah. And so you see how people's values really run the gamut. And, um, you know, we share human experiences and we, um, uh, we process them uh, a little bit differently. These are spiritual questions. Stimulation and strength, humor, yeah. All of this is spiritual, spiritual questions, spiritual direction. 
Okay, this is the type of thing I mean when I say spirituality, finding that meaning and direction in life and con in concert with your values. Okay, so everybody sees how um, spirituality uh, sort of gets defined through the practice of uh, living out our values. Okay, thank you so much. Those are great. Um, feel free to keep them coming as we move on a little bit. Survivorship guilt is um, something that I thought it was important to talk about for a moment, uh, if only just to validate that if you're feeling any form of survivorship guilt, that is so normal. Um, there's nothing wrong with you for feeling that way. Um, let's talk about it for a moment. Survivorship guilt comes up among survivors of traumatic events, um, all kinds, all types of traumatic events, but uh, long-term illness is one of them. It could be the guilt of why, why have I lived longer than others? Um, it could be the guilt of um, feeling like a burden to caregivers. Um, or I really love this one, um, and I, you know, I, I work with people who um, are feeling this way. This pressure to sort of be the perfect survivor and uh, doing everything they can to live the best life possible uh, with cancer after surviving cancer treatment. You know, um, sometimes there's sort of an industry uh, around cancer that can put people under a lot of pressure to, um, to sort of be this model survivor. And uh, when we don't necessarily live up to that ideal, um, we, may feel, uh, we may feel like we're not doing everything we can. Um, all three of these are common forms of survivorship guilt. Um, on the last one, I just want to promise you, as a practicing clinician, the model perfect survivor does not exist. There is no such person in the world. So uh, if you ever feel like you're not that person, please be assured that person does not exist. Guilt is an emotional experience that we have. It doesn't mean we've done anything wrong. It's just an emotion. It's a natural human emotion that comes up when we have uh, survived something difficult, okay? It's totally understandable why anybody would feel in these ways. It doesn't mean that you're a burden to others. It doesn't mean that you uh, need to do more to live, live your best life um, more than what you're doing. Um, it's just an emotional experience that we all share as human beings. So I just wanted to take a moment to validate that. I see a lot of Q&A here. So, um, oh, those were just the values from before. Wonderful. We'll go ahead and move on, but just feel free to share in the Q&A if there's anything you'd like to mention. Um, Let's talk a little bit about grief. Grief is uh, a word that we often use in, uh, uh, in referring to the process of death and dying and loss. Grief is not about death. Grief is about change. So when we lose someone we love, that's definitely an occasion for grief. A, a major change has happened, a change perhaps for the worse. But grief comes up whenever we experience change. Grief is a journey from what was to what is. It's the journey of uh, coming to terms with reality. So our emotional mind moves more slowly than our intellectual mind. Our head moves faster than our heart. So we may know in our head that uh, something has happened, that something is true. And our heart takes some time to catch up to that. That lag time is the experience of grief. 
grief is a mismatch between what is and what we wish could have been. Okay, that's, that's the human experience of grief. Related is anticipatory grief, which is grief before a major event, grief before a major change. Um, so if you feel like something is going to happen in the future and you're already uh, grieving that, that's called anticipatory grief. That's also very common. So grief is a universal human experience. We all go through this in life. And um, especially in survivorship, grief is uh, very common. And I want to validate that um, you know, if your feelings are feelings of grief at any time, that you are not alone. Um, you are on a very well-traveled path. Um, many people feel the same way. And uh, we're really part of a human family here. And uh, we share these experiences. You may have heard of uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief. Um, Kubler-Ross clarified uh, that people don't necessarily experience them in a set order. So um, there's nothing wrong with your grieving if you don't go to bargaining after you go to anger. There's uh, not an expectation that uh, this is a linear step-by-step -step process. What we have are five different ways of grief that you may experience at different times in your journey of grief. Oh, before I go on, I have a Q&A. What if you were told you were a burden? Yeah, if somebody says that to you, that's really gonna bring up some um, guilt emotions, um, okay? Um, it's an emotional experience. Um, one of the ways we can uh, cope with our emotions is just to notice them. So I'm sorry that uh, you were told that if you were told that. I uh, would not wish for people to have the experience of being told they're a burden. Um, but we do have ways to cope with guilt as an emotion. Um, we'll talk about this a little later too, but just noticing it and just saying, you know, I'm having an emotional experience right now. Um, I'm having the experience of feeling guilty, um, maybe because of what was said to me. That self-awareness can help us get out of the sort of rut of being stuck in that uh, negative emotional experience. So just being able to kind of take a step back and observe what we're going through can, uh, can be really helpful. That, that was a great question. Thank you for that. And again, I really am sorry to hear that people have had an experience like that. Okay, let's go on. Um, talking about five types of grieving, five ways of grieving. Okay, they don't necessarily come in any order. One of the, this is a little bit of a bewildering slide, um, but one of the messages I like to uh, leave folks with about grief is that you have your own twists and turns on your personal journey through grief. And it can help to have someone to talk about it with who can maybe help you find your way. But you will come to um, dead ends and turn back. Um, you will eventually find your way uh, through it. And it, uh, you may find that you go from denial to bargaining to acceptance and then back to depression for a moment and then back. You may find that your path takes you on a winding road um, between the, uh, among the different types of grieving from one type to another. So uh, don't feel uh, badly, if you find that your journey is complicated and has twists and turns through grief, all of us do. So um, in a way, it's, it's an invitation to throw out that sort of five step, you know, first you do step one, then you do step two uh, model of grief and realize that each of us has our own path and our own 
winding road through grief. Um, and sometimes talking with somebody about it can help us find our way. Jeremy, excuse me, do you mind um, talking about those five different ways of grieving? Like how might somebody experience bargaining or what that might look like? Or sure. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, sure. So let's start with denial. Um, denial is just when we have this kind of visceral reaction. It's not true. It can't be. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's just what it sounds like. It's just kind of a flat out um, uh, opposition to accepting what has occurred or what is going on. Um, so denial um, can last a while and, and we can come back to denial. Um, but denial is just that feeling of disbelief, okay, resistance to, uh, to what's occurring. Um, anger. Um, anger can be, uh, can manifest as anger at God. Uh, for those of us who believe in God, um, you often see uh, folks angry with God. Um, for those in, uh, in traditions that read the Bible, Job is angry with God. Um, so that's a real example of uh, anger. Anger could manifest as uh, anger at other people um, who are uh, part of your journey, caregivers, uh, hospital staff. Um, it could be anger itself, um, which could bring up emotions also of guilt if you're feeling angry at yourself over anything, okay? That's a common, normal, unpleasant, but uh, normal emotional experience of grief, okay? Bargaining, um, kind of a funny word to be uh, in an emotional experience, but bargaining shows up when you know, when we start saying, if only, um, if only this were different, or I would give anything if this were different. Um, for people with theological beliefs, bargaining can look at look like making deals with God. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes very valid forms of prayer um, can look like bargaining as well. Um, but people are really practicing their religion in ways that are totally valid and that maybe, you know, a lot of people believe are efficacious. So there's kind of a, a, a fine line there when it comes to prayer. Um, but uh, bargaining is just that tendency to, to say, if only, um, or I would, give, I would give this if that were different. That's bargaining, okay? Um, depression. Um, just an overwhelming feeling of sadness um, that, you know, depression is next to acceptance because it's kind of on the way to acceptance, right? When we're in depression, now this isn't clinical depression. I'm not talking about the disease that can be diagnosed as a mental health disorder, um, but depression is a phase of grief um, is when we've actually kind of come to accept what's happened and we're just so, so sad about it um, that it debilitates us and uh, it really um, makes it hard to function from a day-to-day -day, um, uh, -day -day standpoint. So depression is that sort of shutting down um, of, um, of really just feeling um, how awful it is that um, what has happened has happened, okay? And that's totally normal too. And uh, I think we all go through this when we experience grief, okay? These are, you're not alone. These are universal human experiences. Finally, acceptance. Um, it doesn't have to be just, you know, sort of a happy face. Um, it, for some, some people do get there eventually. Um, I see patients who, uh, who get there eventually. Um, acceptance could just be that decision to move on with life and uh, to live um, as best we can, um, given what has happened. Um, so uh, acceptance is uh, when we uh, make that decision to, uh, to just keep on living, 
given what has happened. So, uh, so that's acceptance. You know, as I mentioned, and as you look at the maids, um, acceptance is not always the end of the journey. Okay, there's nothing wrong with you if you feel acceptance one day and then not so much the next day. Okay, that's okay. Um, eventually, uh, grief tends to be a journey toward acceptance. Okay, so that's um, those are some examples of the five ways of grief. Let's talk about how to cope with grief. Um, just being compassionate with ourselves. Um, compassion is a great thing to cultivate. And um, we're not a burden to others when we're compassionate with ourselves. Okay, just being gentle with ourselves. What if it was your best friend who was suffering grief? Um, how would you treat that person? And uh, can you treat yourself in the same way that you would treat your best friend? Um, I'm sorry, I missed a question before. Is bargaining a short-term approach or emotion? Depression is a big one. Um, I, um, I see people stay for different lengths of time um, in these different stages. Um, you know, I work with uh, patients throughout our hospitals. So I see people who are experiencing grief for various different reasons in different situations. And it really does run the gamut. Um, you know, for some people that might be sort of a short term, you know, an hour and then they're, you know, they may be on to something else. Um, for others, you know, I've seen people stay in bargaining for days, um, maybe it's weeks in one case. Um, so it really varies um, person to person. There's a lot of variation there. Okay. Um, availing ourselves of support groups, peer support, therapists. Um, to the extent we have spiritual beliefs or religious beliefs, um, drawing on those beliefs or our values, the values that we just talked about, um, to come to a sense of uh, acceptance. Okay. Different things are going to work for different people. So um, this really is an occasion to sort of throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. You know, I would encourage everybody to try uh, many different coping strategies. And, you know, we can remind you of some of these, uh, if you like, um, and uh, see what works for you. Okay, maybe different things for different people. The previous groups have asked me to talk a little bit about skills. So uh, emotional self-awareness, we were just talking about this a moment before um, when somebody shared a really difficult uh, emotional uh, experience around guilt. So try to name the emotion you're feeling in words. Um, if you're new to this practice, it may seem a little strange. Okay, but do your best. Just give it a shot. Try to name the emotion you're feeling in words. I'm feeling sad right now. Um, I'm having an experience of feeling uh, joyful right now. I'm feeling angry right now. Okay. Um, I just had a patient tell me that the patient was angry. And, you know, what a release it is to be able to put that into words. Just give it a shot. Um, you may find, a lot of people find, that self-awareness, self-observation is a way to avoid being stuck within the emotional experience. Okay? Self-compassion. What if it were your best friend suffering? Can you treat that, can you treat yourself as if you would treat your best friend who was suffering, okay? Can you relate to yourself? There may be things you would do for your best friend that you can't do for yourself, right? Um, but can you approach yourself? Can you relate to yourself as kindly as you would if it were your best friend? Mindfulness. Just being present to the moment, just bringing our uh, thoughts and awareness back to what's happening right now. You know, when 
Naomi led us in the uh, meditation at the beginning of this uh, hour. Um, there was an invitation to just feel our, uh, ourselves in the chair. Really, if it's that simple, just be present to the moment you're in, um, bringing your thoughts back to the here and now. Um, it can be a really powerful practice in um, really in keeping ourselves uh, healthy spiritually. So choose something, whether it's a formal meditation or whether it's just a, a practice that you do when you need to during the day. Um, try to pick something to return your attention to. For some of us, that's the breath. Um, for some of us, that might be the body, you know, the sensation of being in your chair or on the floor. Um, for some of us, it might be something simple in our surroundings. Um, just pick something to return your attention to and really um, focus on that as a way to uh, be mindful of the moment that you're in. Okay. Let's see a QA. Um, embarrassed and frustrated from a previous experience. Yeah. You know, those are, when we have those experiences, it's just so, so useful. Um, many people find it useful to be able to put that into words. So I'm glad that you were able to put that into words. And I, I hope that you too are somebody who finds it useful to be able to just have the release of being able to say, I'm feeling these emotions. Um, let's talk very briefly about three different spiritual paths to wellness. And I'm about to show you a slide that's going to have a lot of text on it. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but um, questions like, what can I take responsibility for? Okay, if we're feeling disempowered, if we're feeling strain in some relationships, um, if we're feeling like um, others aren't helping us as much as maybe they should, is there anything that is under our control? That we, can, that we can take responsibility for and give ourselves a sense of re-empowerment? Is there anything we can exercise control over? Okay, that's a question to ask ourselves sometimes. Um, sometimes we feel alone and we feel like maybe nobody understands us or um, people aren't there for us. Sometimes we feel that guilt of, you know, uh, do I really deserve love and care? Um, so when those things start happening to us, um, it can be useful to just remind ourselves that we're not alone and to ask, how am I part of community? You know, if nothing else, there's this community here in this webinar um, where we have uh, a number of people who are all going through similar experiences. Just that can help remind us that we're not alone, okay? Um, that we're not totally isolated. Um, so availing ourselves of resources that are out there. And if you have any community connections, family support, uh, friends, just reminding yourself that uh, you're part of those communities as well um, can really be a helpful practice. And then, you know, when we get into those times when we start wondering what's ne what comes next or what, what now, um, how do I make meaning out of something that just appears so um, difficult? Um, how should I spend my time given what's happened? Um, going back to our values like we did before, um, and I so appreciate those uh, who, uh, you know, we're able to share some of their values from the exercise. Um, getting in touch with what you most deeply value can help you find meaning uh, moment to moment throughout your day and to get a sense of direction in life. You know, guide your life toward your values. Okay, that's another path to wellness. So let's take a look at a slide with a lot of text. Um, for meaning and direction, can you name a couple of experiences that give your life meaning? Um, 
Can you, and also just to name your values, that's so useful. Um, for community belonging, where do you most feel and where do you most yearn for a sense of belonging or community? Um, just getting in touch with them. And for relationship reconciliation, do you have any unfinished relationships or unresolved relationships? If there's one thing you could do to increase a sense of peace, what would it be about your relationships? So those are um, three different spiritual paths to wellness. Um, useful questions, I think, I hope for us to think about as we go forward in our journey. And, um, you know, this has been a lot. So I just want to welcome you to uh, stay after for Q&A and uh, live Q&A. Um, I'd be happy to uh, talk with you a little bit uh, less formally. And I just want to thank you for uh, being here. Um, yeah, more, more wonderful values, family, helping others, seeing progress, moving forward. Yeah, thank you. It's powerful. UCSF does offer midday mindfulness to the public every weekday at noon for 15 minutes. So uh, we'll send this out if you don't have it. You don't have to write that long URL down. <laughs> don't worry about that. Um, and I just thought this uh, website, selfcompassion.org, self-compassion.org, had some really wonderful resources on self-compassion. So I would um, recommend that to you. Okay. It's up to us to decide what change will mean in our lives and who we will become as a result. Thank you so much for being with me today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And uh, I just want to thank you, Naomi, and uh, everybody um, for spending this time together. Thank you so much, uh, Jeremy. That was really a lovely overview of a really complex uh, subject. And I, just, I really appreciate your insights and just really helping unfold it and, and helping us understand it in a very practical way. So thank you. And yes, as, um, as Jeremy said, please, for those of you watching, um, you can continue to submit questions, um, but we will have a chance. Uh, I think maybe we'll have some time to, for Jeremy to come back on and answer some of those, but also we'll have some time in, in, the, in the after the show where we'll really get a chance to hear from you and hear your voice asking the questions if you'd prefer that. So thank you. Um, so now it's really my pleasure to, to bring on Tolu Ladiande. Tolu is uh, one of our survivors or our thriver, as we like to say. Um, she's going to really, she's going to help us understand spirituality really from a personal perspective and what it means to her. And um, Tolu, or if you're able to turn on your, turn on your video, thank you so much for being here. And I think what I, I would love to do is just to turn it over to you um, and just invite you to um, share with all of us whatever you feel comfortable with, but I know um, spirituality is, is very meaningful to you in your life. And uh, if you could share kind of your journey um, and how it's really helped and helped you and, and changed maybe throughout the course of your, your life. I'd appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, good thing. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, just so everyone knows, I just had a meeting tonight, so I'm in my classroom, but <laughs> that's why all the dust behind me. But um, yeah, um, when I think about my spiritual journey, uh, it is something that happened or it began for me when I was younger. Uh, if you can even see from my name, my family is from Nigeria. And in Nigeria, one of the two biggest things, it's, it's God and it's education. So, um, so it was everyone knows they need to get some sort of, you know, masters or PhDs. And yes, you go to church. So for my parents' generation, they went to church, there wasn't much for it. My, um, they then they slowly they met, they develop a relationship with God, and it became more for them. And um, I grew up in that type of family where Jesus was real. And um, I was five when I made the decision that you know what, 
I would rather go to heaven than go to hell. It was that, it was that simple as a kid. So I went, prayed, dragged my brother along saying, you're going to pray with me because I want you with me. So that's how it all started for me. Um, and, and then from then on, when we moved to America, um, I was six and just seeing how we grew up in California um, and just we had so many different stories and we saw how God took care of us. So that was helping to build my faith in God. And um, in general, I was 13 when I knew that God had called me to be a missionary outside of the U.S. And I was 17 when I knew for sure that the place where he was sending me was Russia. And I mean, it was crazy because I just thought, why would you want me to go to, you want a black girl to go to Russia? Why? You know, it didn't make any sense to me in the beginning, but I knew that that's where he was sending me. So um, when I went, I went to UC Berkeley, I studied neuroscience and, and Russian language, literature and culture, double major. Then 2002, I was like, off I go. I went to Russia and I was in Russia from 2002 to 2015. And that was my home. Um, but everything started when it, everything started in 2014, um, when I started having um, uh, partial seizures. And um, I kept going to the getting MRIs there in Russia and the doctors were telling me that nothing has happened. And in my mind, I'm thinking, it feels like something happened. It wasn't a full seizure when you're on the ground, but it felt like partial seizures. But anyway, that did, basically 2015, I had a major seizure during the night, broke my bed, my teeth had cut through my tongue. So that was, yeah, woke up and I was like, ooh, something happened last night and it had been a major seizure. So at that time, my insurance company said, Tolu, you have three days. <laughs> this was... At the same time before this happened, I was planning to settle in Russia. I was planning to buy my own place. So my mind was one way and God was saying another. So they gave me three days. They said um, uh, that you ha we have your ticket. Um, a doctor is gonna fly from Moscow down to Krasnodar where I live. Um, and then him, they already ordered an ambulance to come and take me. And so I had to try to pack up a flat in my, my apartment you know, that I've been living in for years. Uh, the Russians came, they were helping me trying to pack it up and uh, it was crazy. I, and I knew I needed medication so that I wouldn't have a seizure while I was walking down the street. Um, I was asking them for, I know people take uh, either Keppra or Tegretol. So I was trying to ask them for Keppra, um, but they didn't have it. And they gave me Tegretol instead. Uh, so I got Tegretol there and I got Tegretol here in the U.S. By the time I got here, um, I knew that something was wrong with the medication in my body. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever had an allergic reaction. I had never heard of Steven Johnson syndrome before, but basically you start to itch, you know, and then it goes everywhere and then you start feeling really weak. And, um, and by the time I stopped taking the medicine, it was already too late. By the time I ended up in the first hospital, I knew that something was very wrong. And this was literally a couple of days after I just flew, you know, back from Russia. And um, and it was crazy on the way to this to the first hospital, I was talking to Liana, one of my friends in Russia. They were still there helping me pack up my place. And I was just like, Liana, I'll just, I'll just call you when I get out of the hospital. And then I don't call her back. So she's just like, Tolu, what's going on? Where are you? And so um yeah, when I was in the hospital, I remember when I, I didn't like anyone touching my skin because everything felt so tender. Um, and I didn't, I don't even remember what happened before I left that hospital because the medication they gave me was so strong. But I remember when they were trying to take my blood and you know how it squeezes your arm and I just started screaming. Um, and apparently after that, then you could see the sores. It, so my skin was boiling and then sliding off. And that's what starts happening when you're having a really bad Stephen Johnson syndrome, basically boiled, slid off. Um, and when I got to UCS, UC Davis, um, that's I lost 100% of my skin and my organs inside also shed their skin. Um, and that was in my body. And um, I, when I saw the pictures after, it was, it was amazing to see. I could not... Yeah, so with no skin. Um, and 
I just remember at that time, everything happened so fast. Everything happened so fast. I remember when I was in the first hospital, I was thinking, why do I, I feel like I'm dying? I didn't know what was going on inside. And my prayer to God was, but God, I gave you, you said, you know, go to Russia. I went, it was amazing. It was an adventure I will never regret. And my prayer to God was just like, what did I do wrong? It's like, I did what you wanted me to do. And then now you're punishing me for it in a very, 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 very painful way. Um, and so I didn't get it. I didn't understand what was going on. And there wasn't time to think because uh, they just, they gave me a lot of medication for the pain. And I remember every time I would wake up again and I realized I was in the hospital, my prayer was, God, take me out of this body. I can't, I can't deal with this pain. This is too much. And um, yeah, my and my brother and sisters were there. And I mean, everyone was praying. <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, but I just I was thankful that I had family that was there. And uh it just getting through that was really difficult. I had two major dreams in that too. Uh, while I was in UC Davis, the first one, I was basically tested, you know, um, it was just a dream where God tested me that will I still follow him, even though I'm going through all of this, and I have no clue what was going on. And I had to think about it, like, is there a God out there? Was I just doing something ridiculous, you know, and it made me think and at the very end, I was like, you know what, I've seen a lot, I have no clue why this is happening. But God, you know what? I'm still following you, Jesus. So that was the first one. The second one, the second dream is what got me out of the bed because in that dream, I knew I was in the hospital. But at that time, in that dream, I had one of my teammates who were in Russia come up to me in a plane. I was in a plane, in, in the hospital bed, in a plane. One of my teammates came up to me and said, Tolu, you've been healed. You've been healed. And I'm thinking, I'm not healed. I'm still in the hospital. What is this about? So I had that dream twice. And the second time I was like, huh, I guess I'm not going to die. Okay, let me, you know, God, let's, let's get this healing going so I can get out of here because I'm in intensive care. I don't know who's going to pay for this. So that, that was what was going through my mind. Um, and so I was in, at UC Davis for about a month. And I remember the skin grew back. Uh, it's like baby skin. I can actually say I was white for a few for a few weeks. It was white skin and it darkened. Um, and so this skin is like six year old skin that I have. Um, and I remember when the doctor said, you know what, Tolu, we're so sorry, you still have the brain tumor. Um, so you still need to get your brain surgery. And so when I was slowly at the end of the month, uh, that month, able to leave UC Davis, I felt like I was dust that they swept into a dust fan, put into a Ziploc bag, and they said, good luck, good luck with your brain surgeries. Um, then started the brain surgery cycle. I had my first one. Um, after the first one, then they told me, sorry, Tolu, you have a brain infection. We need to go back in. And I remember Dr. Berger was my doctor. And up until then, I never had time to really recover. I mean, everything in my body had to recover. When I left UC Davis, skin was still growing in several places and my eyes, um, they sold my eyes shut at UC Davis because they're trying to save me from blindness. But it, they were so destroyed that there was no tears in my eyes, so it was hard to blink. So that was something that I was still taking care of and still going through. I, I really wasn't thinking of everything. I was just trying to survive day after day. Then I had to do the first surgery. When the second came about, I mean, I, I broke down because it was just like, it was too much. It's one after the other after the other. It was already 2016. And um, and I remember just going through that and one more surgery after that and going through radiation, chemo, six weeks of trying to get rid of the infection when you have a needle in your arm. Um, a lot was going on. There was anger towards God. So even though I know he took me out of the first one, I went through that depression, when I said I felt like dust, it was like, I know I hate depression, but then it went even further. It's like someone dug a hole and you kept on falling. Um, so I knew I was in deep depression. I didn't want to, apparently I snapped at everyone that talked to me. I didn't realize that until afterwards, um, because 
some of my friends, I'm like, where's so-and-so? Where's so-and-so? And my, my sister's like, well, uh, you kind of snapped at them every time you talk. So my, my reaction was to fire back when they talked to me because for some reason, I just felt hurt. It's like they were touching and what they said pained me in some way. And I reacted by snapping back and I didn't even realize it. And, um, and so I just saw how uh, through 2016 and 17 and 18, God slowly brought me out of that hole. Um, the values in the Bible, love, joy, peace, long suffering. I felt like I was suffering long and I felt like that was being developed more, even more. I thought I knew. But this was a whole new level, learning to, you know, love the people around me, learning to experience joy, learning to have peace, even though there was a lot of things that could have um, made you go crazy, make you make you scared, um, learning to look at God and trust in him. For me, um, that was a huge thing. That is what helped me because I did not pull myself out of that, that that situation I was in was so deep. I just even though I knew he got me out of the first hospital, I still went through the, the, you know, three brain surgeries, chemo, radiation, infection, all of that. Um, and then after I was done with all of that, mentally, psychologically, spiritually, I needed to be healed from all of that. And that took, that took years. So everyone thought, oh, Tolu's fine, but I wasn't. I still had to heal from all of those. So um, for me, when I think about my spiritual, uh, what spirituality is for me, God, I mean, I felt like God was the one that directed my life before. I felt like, you know, there's scripture in the Bible that talks about he's our foundation, he's our rock. And so that's, those verses were in my head all the time, like I'm hiding in him a rock so that I will not be shattered, that he's carrying me through the storm. And he really did. And there are some things that surprised me afterwards. The fact that I can even teach. I mean, just a lot of things I was able, and I'm doing my master's now, just a lot of things that I never thought I'd be able to do again. I saw God bring back into my life. And he, I, you know, I believe that everyone is born with a purpose and a reason to live. So when I knew that I wasn't going to die from the first thing, I saw how he took me to the second thing. And then, um, and I know that he's directing my steps. So as far when it comes to spirituality um, and Jesus, I feel like that that's what he pulled me out of that hole. And um, and he gave me all, you know, increase those things inside of me to be able to survive and actually experience joy again and experience peace and knowing how to suffer long. And I think my time is up. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Tolu. That, wow, that is such an incredible story. And um, I'm just like, I'm just kind of blown away by all that you've been through with the Stephen Johnson syndrome and that like, no wonder you look so youthful. You have six-year-old skin. <laughs> but the way that you have that joy, I can see like what you've been through. You would have never, you know, you'd never know to, to, to know you now and, and the joy that you just exude and um, all the vitality you have, you would never know that you went through so much. And, and I, I love hearing, you know, the kind of the rock that you had with your spirituality was really your bedrock through all of this. Um, and I heard a lot of the, I think maybe, I don't know if there were stages of grief, but you know, you talked about anger and depression and then kind of an acceptance. And, um, and I'm curious um, just around like, can you talk a little bit about the low point when you were kind of doing that, when you're very angry at God, like that must've been very painful uh, to feel that. Yeah. yeah yes. I, it's, it's true. It's, that's true. I even forgot about that. Um, because at that time, uh, between 2015 and 20, 2015 to 2017, um, I didn't want to talk to God. And so my prayers were always like, you know, my family would be like, Tolu, just, you know, play your guitar and talk to God. And my prayer is just like, God, I don't want to talk to you today. Next day, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to you today either. And that was be the end of my prayer. And um, and I know slowly um, because the kept. Uh, I, I was before all of this happened. Right before he, I left playing the guitar, I would be the neighbor that you know you'd hate to be around because you could hear the guitar playing. You know, and when this happened, I did not touch my guitar for two years. There was no desire whatsoever. Um, and so even slowly after the two years were over, picking it up, playing one song and then putting it down. Um, it just it just showed the little bit that it takes 
steps. You, you can't just be pulled out of it. Um, it took steps. My prayers with God got longer than, you know, an actual, you know, conversation, <laughs> not just, I don't want to talk to you today, you know, so, and then also with the guitar to music, I slowly came back into my life, so. Wow, yeah, that's wonderful. I love how you weaved in music and that kind of touched in different, it sounds like that touched different parts of you and, and it kind of helped open you up again, you know. To, it's a big thing in my life too. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's wonderful. Well, thank you, thank you so much for sharing. And and if you could stick around, um, that would be wonderful. I, I wanted to invite Jeremy back and then ask all of you if you have any more questions. I know there's been a couple that have come through. So I'm just going to um, read out some of the questions here. Um, Let's see, there was a question around the uh, the quote that you had, um, Jeremy, uh, if you could please uh, share that again or the, the person that wrote it. Sure, happy to, I'll put it in the chat right now. Great, thank you so much. Um, and as you're doing that, uh, there's another question around the spiritual care services at UCSF. I know that they're, they provide services for inpatient and um, maybe Jeremy, this is another question for you around what, what services are available to, um, to patients, both inpatient and outpatients, um, spiritual care services at UCSF. Yeah, thank you. Um, we do primarily serve inpatients. Um, that's, uh, just how the hospital is structured. Um, I wish we had, uh, more, uh, ability to serve outpatients on a day-to-day -day basis, um, we do uh, uh, presentations like this and just, you know, the ability to spend some time with uh, folks in the outpatient community and uh, hopefully to be of support that way. Um, Naomi, you're uh, very welcome to um, email me and maybe we could continue some conversations about that and figure out if there's anything else that we can do to be of support. That's great. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. And I always um, go to our community to, to see if they have any ideas of what would be supportive for them uh, as survivors. And, and sometimes people go back into hospital for another surgery. So what would, would be helpful? Um, yeah. Thank you. Great. And then is there, for those who are just kind of exploring that maybe don't have a, a real solid yet feeling of their connection to their kind of spirituality, um, do you have any books or, or resources that you might recommend? to as an introduction to wow uh yeah there are so many um why don't i take a moment and uh compile a few resources and send them to you and then maybe you could send them out to the group great yeah um, perfect yeah let and, me let me get a best of or greatest hits of spirituality and uh see what we can come up with great perfect yes and for everyone who's registered and all of you that are watching now i will be sending a follow up email that includes this recording as well as uh, all the resources that we're mentioning um all right and just going to take a look at the the q and a um oh there is a question for you tolu uh i don't believe you mentioned if you if you're there still if you're able to come back on video um i don't believe you mentioned the type of, of tumor someone was just interested if you're inter if you're able to share it if you're wanting to share. I know, seriously, give me a, give me a second. Oh, I sure. I remember the oligard, uh, like a... Uh, Ol oligo, oligodendroglioma, <laughs> is that it? Yeah, thank you, that's it. <laughs> it's a mouthful, yes. <laughs> but I, I know. Think, yeah, <laughs> okay, thank you. And yeah, great. Um, okay, and another question coming through. Oh, this is a question for you, um, Jeremy. How does your math background interact with your spirituality or vice versa? Great question. Oh, you know, um, I wish I got that question more. That's This is the first time in a few years. I love this question. Um, you know, math uh, is about the truth. And um, in some ways, spirituality is too. You know, grief, the journey of grief is definitely about the truth. Um, so it's you know, it's, it's really our relationship with the truth um, and uh, in some ways a search for the truth, uh, ways, ways of being in touch with the truth. Um, sometimes it's easier and sometimes it, it can be really very difficult um, to be in touch with the truth. But uh, for me, that's a common thread. Um, 
There's also just sort of a way, to, a way of thinking. Um, mathematics teaches us to be open to many different possibilities. Um, it teaches us that sometimes our intuitions are wrong. Um, so not necessarily to rely on, you know, common sense for everything, but to keep our minds open. Maybe the truth is different from what we think. Um, so those are some common threads for me, but thank you for that question. I love that question. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, and let's see, I, there might be a few other questions here. Um, I'll just take a quick look. Just a lot of thank yous. Thank you so much to Tolu. Uh, and I'm glad that all of you are joining us. Anything else that you would like to share? We will have a chance for discussion in the, after the show. And we can start that a little bit early unless anybody wants to submit any questions. Thank you all. Thank you for your kind comments in the, in the Q&A chat box there. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now. Uh, thank you so much for doing that. And yeah, thank you. For those of you who are leaving us now, I really appreciate you joining us. We're uh, gonna be here again. We are gonna take off a couple of months um, from our webinars, but we will have some other activities. So if you are on our mailing list, we will be sure to let you know other events that we have coming up. Um, we will be back again for sure in the new year and doing these on the third Wednesday of each month. And um, Jeremy and Tolu, I really wanna thank you for just being with us and, and sharing with all of us some very personal, very, um, yeah, very kind of heartfelt explanations uh, and, you know, experiences around spirituality. So thank you so much. I feel like I kind of have a deeper understanding of it.